Morning YouTube. I feel like it's been a while since I've been on here to give you an update of where we're at. Uh, see, last time we talked about carburation and uh, engine running on the 66. I posted a little short clip. It actually does run. Pulled it in out of the garage, back and forth on the driveway. Uh, just a transmission check mostly, make sure the brakes felt okay. Uh, I haven't taken it up the street yet to uh, make sure transmission shifts and that kind of thing. Uh, still need to refine the timing just a little bit. I think timing needs to go a little bit higher. Uh, the cam that's in this motor, uh, it's a Edelbrock Performer RPM. So it's pretty lopy cam at idle, to be honest. That's the reason I put that, that cam in this motor, just because it sounds good. Uh, but with the 350 turbo that's in this thing, uh, it needs a stall converter. Uh, so right, it's still got the factory uh, stock torque converter in it right now. Uh, so when you put it in gear, it pulls out of way down. It kind of wants to die a little bit if you don't feather the fuel, the gas a little bit. Uh, but anyway, you'll see the hole in the hood. It no longer has the three do setup on it. I went back and put a uh, just a single four barrel intake and a Holly 600, and went ahead and put an HEI distributor in it, just because that's what I'm more familiar with. It's very simple. One wire I got rid of, you know the the external coil and that kind of stuff that I'm just not used to. Uh, that stuff's not complicated. It's just not what I'm used to. I went back to what I, I know, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, to make it run. And uh, it started up pretty well, not as easily as uh, normally small block Chevy, but uh, with, I finally had to get a, a buddy of mine to come over and uh, turn the key for me and finally got it to, to start and run long enough I could set the timing on it. Uh, anyway, it is running now, although it needs to be tuned a little bit. Uh, let me show you what I put on in the uh, for carburation. As I said before, you know, the hole in the hood doesn't make any sense with a uh, single four barrel, but I've got a plan for that. I'm going to show you a little bit later what we're going to do to fix the hole in the hood. Uh, so now it's, it looks more like, like just a regular old stock 350. You know, nothing really major. Uh, first thing for today is I need to do uh, front end alignment on the thing uh, before I really get it up and you know, back and forth on the street and see how transmission does and how it really kind of drives. I need to line these front wheels. I've already gone through and done a preliminary alignment on it, so it's pretty close now. Uh, but I want to go back and and go through the alignment one more time on it just to uh, make sure everything's kind of as close as I can get it. The camber is still not exactly where I'd like for it to be, uh, mostly because I've run out of shims on this uh, passenger side. Uh, I really need to pull one more shim out of it, and uh, the threads that far in on that stud, uh, it don't feel like there's any threads there, or the threads are really grimy. So I need to take it back apart and, and look at that a little bit. But anyway, I'm going to show you how to do a do-it-yourself alignment at home. Okay, for a do-it-yourself alignment at home, you will need some some uh, equipment, some specialized tools. Uh, you can do it with a you know a string or a tape measure to do set the toe. Uh, you can use uh, just a normal uh, angle finder, like a, a nice digital angle finder. You could use a bubble, I guess. Uh, but there's a little more math involved in doing this, and it's not quite as, as straightforward as uh, buying the proper equipment. Uh, I consider you know going to an alignment shop and having it professionally aligned. I may still at some point, but uh, my thoughts are, you know, anytime you do front end work, you know, change struts on a car, you change tie rods, you know, even ball joints or oil control arms, that type of thing, or bushings. Quite often, uh, I kind of need to reset the, the alignment myself here in the shop. So, you know, alignment these days costs around $80 in a lot of places. Uh, I end up spending about $250 for the equipment so, you know, about three alignments, uh, this equipment will pay for itself. It's like a lot of the other tools and equipment here in the shop. You know, if, if you do the math on it, often it doesn't take too much to go ahead and buy the tool, buy the equipment to do the job the right way. So that's what I've opted to do here. I do enough work, I felt like it was justified. Uh, the first thing you need is a good caster camber gauge. Uh, this is the one I bought, it's from uh, Deco. Uh, it's got, let me get a little bit closer here. <clears throat> it's got, you know, bubble levels in it, but it's designed uh, so that the two, well, first of all, it's got a magnet on this end that you stick to the uh, hub, the spindle, 
uh, on your vehicle. And uh, so then it'll stick that way out of the hub. It's got a level here so you can you can level the thing side to side. But then the, the outsides here, you can read your camber. Uh, that's how far the top of the tire is uh, out or in. And then the center here, you can uh, do the caster. And I'll show you how to use that. So that's the first thing you need. Then after you set your caster and camber, uh, you need to set your uh, toe. And I bought a set of toe plates. It's a couple of bent aluminum plates uh, that rest against the outside of the, of the tire, one on each side. Uh, it's been out at the bottom because you know there's a bulge at the at the bottom of your tire where it, where it sits on the ground. So that's what the angle is for at the bottom. But basically, you rest these against the tire, and then it comes with a pair of uh, tape measures so that you can measure in these slots from one side to the other, and you can set your toe. Uh, pretty simple. When I did it initially on this truck, it worked really well. I did buy one more piece of equipment. I ended up not needing it on this vehicle, but the caster camber gauge, uh, on certain vehicles, you may not be able to get to the hub well enough to use that magnet to stick against the hub, the spindle. Uh, so this is a wheel adapter that will clamp to the wheel. And it's got options to clamp on the inside of the wheel or the outside of the wheel lip. And uh, it gives you a place for your caster camber gauge to magnetically stick to this wheel adapter. Uh, this was a little more money. 130 140 dollars something like that but sooner or later i will need this like on my wife's car or maybe on the challenger or something like that but uh so that's something to stick on the shelf that may come in handy one day okay first step in doing your alignment is to uh set your uh, caster and camber uh the book says to do the camber first camber is how far the top of the tire is leaning out or leaning in uh ideally you want it either straight up at zero or the top of the tire leaning in half a degree to one degree, something like that. Uh, and then caster is if you draw a straight line between the lower ball joint and the upper ball joint, it's how much lean back there is uh, in that imaginary line between those two uh, points in your ball joints. And uh, most vehicles probably want the caster of the top ball joint back around two or three degrees probably. Personally, I like to set up like my Jeep's uh, solid axle four-wheel drive vehicles in the five to seven degrees caster. Uh, I was not able to get that much caster on this truck. I was able to get it to about three and three quarter, three and a half, something like that, which is okay. That's probably in the ballpark what the factory specs were. Uh, but anyway, that's what, that's what caster is. I found that caster... Uh, was a little more tedious to try to get. Uh, I felt like if I could get the angle of those ball joints set first, then the in and out adjustment for the camber was a little bit easier to get. Uh, the adjustment on these old trucks in the uh, is on the top A-arm. You have to add or remove shims, either to the front of the A-arm or the back of the A-arm in order to get that triangulated A-arm to shift, you know, the top ball, ball joint to move in order to set your caster. But once you get that angle correct, then the in and out is easy. You know, you add or subtract the same amount of shims on both sides in order to get the tilt, the camber, of the top of the tire correct. So in my mind, caster would be the first thing I would set. But anyway, what I've done, I've removed the, the center cap of the wheel, and then I've removed the uh, dust cap from uh, the center, and that covers your, your wheel bearings. And that gives me a nice flush area here. Now you want to check this surface, make sure there's no burrs or dirt or anything on it. It needs to be clean because that's where your magnet's going to sit. So then you set the magnet on it, on that hub. And then we're going to level with this level out here. So between the lines. And we can uh, read our camber this way. Camber is on the outside, the two outside uh, bubbles here. Uh, one side tells you negative, so how far in the, the top of the tire is. The other side is positive, so how far out from zero that is. Right now, I'm sitting at about between half a degree and three quarters of a degree negative camber. I always get confused on my positive and negative, so I'll tend to, you know, which way, you know, makes which bubble move. So negative is the top of the tire 
pushed in, which is what you want, a little bit of negative camber. So we're, sh we're showing about right. We're showing between half and three quarters of a degree of negative camber, so that's pretty good. Okay, for caster, <clears throat> you need to turn the wheel. So basically, your first measurement, you want the front of the tire out from the vehicle at about 20 degrees. Uh, you can do chalk lines or tape lines on the floor and measure your 20 degrees, uh, but the way this device is made, these angles machined here at the end is your 20 degree mark. So if you'll turn the wheel to where this angle is perpendicular to the truck, you know, run evenly down the side of the truck, that's 20 degrees. So it, uh, that's the reason I bought this type of gauge is it, it kind of gives you that angle anyway, you know, to kind of help you out. So let's do that. I did, I did put a, uh, I don't have a set of turn plates to help me move the, turn the front wheels easily. So I put down a couple of trash bags, you know, plastic on plastic rubs pretty well. So it makes it much easier to, uh, the truck sitting in place for the tires to spin. I still can't do it manually out here, so I'm still gonna turn the, the steering wheel, but let's get it set so the front of the tire is out 20 degrees. Okay, my tire's turned, so this angle is about perpendicular to the side of the truck. Uh, on this truck, it's just about lock to lock. That is your 20 degree this way, 20 degree that way. So I'm gonna level the gauge again using the bubble out here. And then I'm gonna use this knob to zero the caster. That's the center bubble. So get the middle of the bubble at the zero mark. And then we'll turn the wheels 20 degrees the other direction. And then we'll read our caster. Okay, now we're 20 degrees the other direction. We're gonna level the gauge again. And then the reading is our caster. So we're showing, yeah, we're about three and three quarter, almost four degrees of caster. So that's pretty good. So to check on this wheel, it, it looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna look at the other side. Camber from one side to the other really doesn't make much difference in how the truck will drive. Caster, however, if the caster is different from one side to the other, the side with more caster, the truck will tend to pull that direction. In the old days, well, some alignment shops still do it today, uh, they would set your passenger side, the right side, with just a little bit more caster than the driver's side. Uh, they, I've heard a couple of different reasons. I've heard it's, you know, so if you fall asleep or not paying attention, the vehicle will tend to, to go to the right side off of the road rather than to the left and into oncoming traffic. I've also heard it was to uh, combat the, uh, what do you call it, the, the curvature of the road. can't remember the word. Anyway, some of the roads are pitched to the outside so that rainwater will pitch to the outside. Uh, so Therefore, they do that to counteract you know, the, the crown in the road. That's the word I'm looking for, a crown. I'm not buying that. Uh, a lot of times, especially on a four-lane highway, you know, if you look at the crown in the road, the uh, left lane will be crowned to the left or the right lane will be crowned to the right. So the, the water will tend to run off both directions. So to me, I'd rather have my caster the same. I don't want it pulling one direction or the other. I want it to just go straight ahead if I were to let go of the wheel. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. And once you get your caster and camber set up on both sides the way you want it, then tow will be the last thing you do. Okay, I've got my caster and camber set up on both sides and they're pretty close. Uh, this gauge also comes in a really nice padded case to uh, protect it, take care of it. And uh, I really like it. It does a really nice job. Okay, so now we're gonna use our tow plates and uh, I'll show you how to use those. Okay, I've got my tow plates set against the, the tires on both sides. And uh, like I say, the bend on the bottom is because of the bulge on the bottom of the tire. So you put your plates kind of centered on the tire and firm against the tire. I've got my tape measures on both sides, front and rear, going from side to side. Now, one of these plates has little magnets on the end here, and those little magnets is to hold the tape measure secure. So you put tape measure on each side that way. Make sure the plate is firm against the tire. And then we'll go to the other side and read the measurements. Okay, same thing on this side. I've got my, my plate firm against the wheel. I'm going to put my tape measure in the slots on both sides. Okay, 
and just read the measurements. Uh, basically, you want about an eighth of an inch of toe in. So you'll want the front measurement to be about an eighth of an inch more or less than the rear measurement. Uh, the good thing about these tape measures is uh, all the little marks are, are labeled. Uh, so it kind of takes the guesswork out of reading a tape measure. Not that that's difficult, <laughs> but some people have more issues with that than others. So at the back here, let's see, I'm at about 75 and 3 sixteenths, I guess. 75 and 3 sixteenths. So at the front, our little one will be 75 and 1 sixteenth. Uh, so I'm towed out just, well, it's almost straight ahead. So I need to tow in just a little bit. So I'll tighten up my my tie rods a little bit to bring the toe in into spec and the uh, alignment will be finished. Okay, now that the wheel alignment's finished, on to the next project for the day, how to take care of that hole in the hood. Uh, ideally, I would replace the hood. A uh, cowl induction hood would be nice. They're expensive. Uh, a new stock replacement hood is over $1,000 now in the neighborhood of uh, Ten fifty or eleven hundred dollars for a new stock hood. Uh, looking on marketplace and Craigslist for used hoods, people seem to be wanting like five hundred dollars for an old used crappy hood these days. That's not in my budget for the, for now, for right now. Uh, one day I'll run across a good deal on a replacement hood. Until then, how do we fix that hole in the hood? You know that hole is set up for three deuces for three small air cleaners to stick out. Uh, now we got a single four barrel carburetor on there. It don't look right. And the air cleaner sticking through there. So how are we gonna fix that? Uh, the problem is we're trying to patch that hole, you know, weld in a sheet metal patch and cover the hole is these ribs. I'm not good enough with sheet metal. I don't have a, a sheet metal bender or a bead roller or anything like that to try to duplicate these, ridge, these ridges. It'd be really hard for me to try to duplicate that. If I did make it look okay on the top side, uh, it would probably have quite a bit of uh, Bondo fiberglass in it to get the shape just right. And then underneath it just wouldn't look right. Ever since I was a little kid, uh, and one of the reasons why I put the three deuces sticking just through the hood so you could see them, you know, as a kid, what's the first thing that, that really catches your eye, you know, looking at a hot rod? Uh, it's when stuff sticks through the hood. He said, you know, grab a big air scoop or air cleaners or something, blower, tunnel ram or something sticking out of the hood. That grabs your attention. The little kid in me still wants something sticking through the hood. I know it's a single four barrel carburetor, but if you do it just right and, you know, somewhat subtly, I think it's still going to look okay and it'll grab, grab your eye, you know, kind of draw your attention to the truck. So my plan is... Cut a nice big hole for big air scoop. Now, it won't be sticking through the hood this far. It'll be kind of subtle like the 3D setup was. Uh, with the measurements that I've taken, I'm going to use a 2-inch spacer between the carburetor and the bottom of this air scoop. Only about half of that scoop will be sticking through the hood. Uh, when you raise the hood, it's going to look a little funny having this large air scoop on top of a single 4-barrel carburetor. Uh, but, you know, with the hood closed, you don't have to raise the hood. <laughs> you can show, every, show all your secrets. From the outside, I think it's gonna make the truck look pretty cool. I think it's just, you know, another little feature. I think it'll look okay when we're finished. It looks funny to stay on top of the hood. When we're finished, I think it's gonna look pretty good. So the reason I had to go with the large air scoop is cause they make a smaller one for the single four barrel. Uh, the hole in the hood is already too large for the little small scoop. And personally, I don't care for the way the little short stubby scoops look. I prefer the look of the big one. Uh, Again, it looks funny with just a single carburetor underneath it. It really needs two carburetors underneath it, but it is what it is. So I went with the large scoop because of the size of that hole in that hood. So the first thing I need to do is I need a pattern because I'm gonna have to make that, the hole in the hood even larger to fit this scoop. Uh, so I got to thinking, you know, what's the easiest way to make a pattern? You know what, the box that this scoop came in is a really good size. It's it's pretty close to the size of the hole that I would like to have in the hood for the scoop to stick through. I like for the, the hole to be fairly close, you know, not unreasonably close, but you know, 
an inch or so on each side would be nice. Uh, probably need a little bit more than that on the ends, but I think the box is probably going to make a pretty good pattern. So I'm going to cut the, the bottom out of this box or maybe the top and use that as a starting point uh, to make a pattern so I can cut this head. Okay, I've got the top of the box cut out and I traced the back end because I'd like for the hole to kind of follow the contour of the back of the scoop and sort of around it. And uh, I think I'm in pretty decent shape for a pattern. I will probably end up having to add an inch or so up here on the front because of the way the hood, you know, will close down over the, the front of the scoop. Uh, so I may add an inch or so outside of this cardboard template, but that's pretty much it. It gives me something to uh, trace for the hood. Okay, now that I've got the cardboard uh, template cut out, I still need to know where my air cleaner stud is going to be. Where's the center of the carburetor on this pattern? And to do that, uh, the way this thing mounts, it's got this carb spacer that bolts to the bottom of the carburetor, then it has an adapter plate, then an air cleaner bolts down on top of that, and then your scoop goes in on top of that and bolts to this large plate. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt, really. It's got, it, it originally had eight bolts in it, but I ended up making a custom uh, adapter plate. Uh, it's a little bit rough right now, so I clean it up and paint it. But in order to get the scoop to sit, to sit front to back the way I wanted it to, to stick through the hood exactly right, uh, I ended up having to make a new adapter plate. But anyway, I need to locate that in the scoop so I can figure out, you know, where is the center of the carburetor in relation to this pattern. So this is going to sit on there. Basically just like that, same size as that box. So the center of the carburetor is going to be the center of that hole, obviously. So that stud is going to be right about there. It'll be in the center, side to side, but I'm going to get as close to right as I can. So if I draw me a line across those two marks and find the center of that pattern, that should be where the carburetor stud comes up through the hood and that will locate the pattern for me in the hood. And there we have the pattern on the hood centered on the contours and I've already done a sharpie line all around it. So uh, that should be where that scoop's gonna stick through the hood. And like I say, it's only gonna stick through about half, about halfway, so it'll only stick up about two inches. So I'm still kind of curious, you know, what the, if it's going to be enough space at the front of the scoop or if I'm going to have to move the cut line a little bit further forward so when the hood opens and closes, you know, it'll clear that top edge of the scoop. I'm not sure. I'm kind of debating. Do I come ahead and add a little bit or go ahead and cut it first and refine it later? I think I may cut it first. I'm going to use a unit bit on these front corners. I don't want a, a sharp corner on the front of that cut. I want a rounded corner. Uh, so I've already center punched there. I just eyeballed it, you know, where the center of that radius is going to be with you know, a bit. I'll probably regret that, but let's see what happens. Too far <laughs> not bad i'm running short on cutting discs so uh let's see how far i might get this i think it'll do okay
the things that's been on my list of uh, things to buy over the years is a welding blanket. I don't have one. I need one, but uh, we use cardboard instead. That'll work just as well as a welding blanket, right? No, probably not. Glass would be good out there too. Use a welding hammer for a little while, and it's just too dark. You can't see what you're doing. They do not expect the blacks for this. Again, I just haven't bought any. Okay, nobody died. Nobody got hurt. Still got most of my fingers and toes. Nothing's on fire, so I call that a success. A little blistering paint on the top of the hood, but the hood would be painted anyway. When you're out of cutting this, what other choice do you have? You know, use what you got. I know this really long stud. That's the stud that goes in the air scoop. I put the uh, normal air cleaner on it, uh, mostly to cover the carburetor, and I'll drop the wing nuts. I probably got spare someplace. Get this out of the way. Okay. The way this uh, air cleaner assembly goes on, I'm gonna use a two inch spacer on top of the carburetor. That just gives me a little more air scoop through the hood so it doesn't look quite so funny. If that makes sense. Okay, then our adapter plate goes on. Our air cleaner goes on. And they bowing that again. And the scoop goes on. And there's uh, six bolts in the bottom that attaches the scoop to that base plate. But for this purpose, that should be good. Let's see if everything clears. Nice. Clears perfectly. That don't look too bad, right? The front of the scoop sticks through a little bit more than I thought it would. There's good clearance all the way around. Pretty even all the way around. And to be honest, I can't really tell that there's only one carburetor down in there. Even right up here that close. I mean, if you're looking for it, you can see it, but it's not noticeable at all. I don't think it looks too bad. I think it looks pretty decent. Kind of a subtle scoop through the hood. Gives it a little bit of interest. It doesn't look quite as good as the three deuce, but considering, uh, I think it looks pretty decent. That is the way the truck's gonna sit. Air pressures and airbags are correct. I still need the bed liner of the inside of the bed. Overall, I like it. Overall, other than the front bumper and some glass, the outside of the truck, it's pretty much the way it's gonna look. Uh, obviously the hood needs to be painted. It's a little bit different color. It needs a little more body work, especially where I blistered the paint with the plasma cutter, but it's okay. Not a problem. It will probably be a primer for a little while. I like it. 
in a driver's point of view. That's pretty awesome. I like it. Kind of fulfills that childhood fantasy, you know? Something sticking through the hood. I love it.